Okay, I'm just gonna come out and say it. I really like Stranger Things. I know, I know. Thank me for my service. Much like being a creepy dude giving out free candy from a windowless van, this show has become one of my favorite ways to spend my free time. Now, my girlfriend Kelsey had never seen the show, so over the last couple weeks, we just kind of ordered way too much Uber Eats and Marathon the entire thing front to back. And I think I realized something important here, okay? Think... I think the show might take place in the 80s. But hey, it's just a theater. <laughs> but seriously though, watching it back now, I gotta be honest here, Stranger Things has really kind of lost its sense of self, I feel like. It's like they set up all these ideas and logic threads of why certain things are happening the way they are, and then they just kind of totally ignore them and brush them aside later in the show. Or I guess an easier way to say this, and I don't use these words lightly, okay, but Stranger Things is kind of turning into Riverdale? Let me explain what I mean. Why Stranger Things is kind of dumb. Now. Also, like, I know I'm, like, the four millionth person to make a video about this, so I'm, I'm sure someone else has had the same thoughts as me at some point, but whatever, here we go. But before that, really quick, this video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. Well, it's 2022, somehow. Pretty much everyone knows what a VPN is. It protects you when you're on the internet, it stops your IP address from being hacked, and your personal data getting exposed. I mean, everybody needs one. But Surfshark VPN goes above and beyond your typical VPN. You can use it on as many devices as you want with just one subscription. They also offer their Surfshark alert service that checks to see if your personal data has been leaked anywhere, like usernames, passwords, that kind of thing. So you can stay one step ahead. As well as their Surfshark search engine which is a completely private and organic search engine free from data tracking and overreaching algorithms. And get this, you can sign up to Surfshark VPN today by going to surfshark.deals slash Alex Myers and use the promo code Alex Myers to get 83% off the regular price when you sign up for a two-year subscription. That means you get premium VPN services and a guaranteed peace of mind using any device or all of them at the same time, plus three extra months for free. So if you don't have a VPN, then you really need to sign up. But even if you already have one, go to surfshark.deals slash Alex Myers and use the promo code Alex Myers to give Surfshark a try. Okay, back to the show. The way we're introduced to Eleven in the show is that she's like the last remaining test subject of this weird science experiment to give kids telekinesis or whatever. They've been using her to listen in on the Russians and stuff, and one day she contacts this mysterious monster thing, and in doing so, inadvertently opens up a gateway to an alternate dimension, which allows the monster dude to come into the real world. And after this, she freaks out, kills like 50 people in the lab, and runs away. This leads her to find Mike and everyone else, and the story goes on from there. I'm assuming you know the show, so I'm not gonna recap the whole thing. But throughout the show, she learns to use her powers more, and in season two, she runs away to Chicago and meets another former test subject, number eight, who teaches her to deep dig down into her subconscious and use her sad, angry memories to unlock this kind of Super Saiyan skill tree or whatever and like move trains and stuff. But then in season three, she can barely fight against Billy and the Mind Flayer, even though she was flipping vans and moving trains and making the face I make about five minutes after I say, well, this two-day Taco Bell can't be that bad. But the point is, throughout the first three seasons, we learn who Eleven is, why she is that way, how her powers work, why they work that way, and what her motivation is for doing what she does, okay? And then season four comes along and just takes all that and throws it in the trash. Season four does that thing that Riverdale loves to do, and most long-running teen dramas end up doing at some point, where they establish a bunch of lore and character arcs and things like that. And then just out of nowhere, they're like, yeah, so uh, actually this uh, even more important thing happened before all of this. And this is actually the most important thing for this character. Uh, we just, you know, didn't mention it until now. <laughs> Woo, look at this clever plot twist. The entire point of the first three seasons of Stranger Things is that you could wear literally anything in the 80s. But the second most important thing is that Eleven opened up the gate by accident, which opened up this whole secret world. And she's scared of her own powers. Dr. Brenner's trying to get her back because she's dangerous. And that's what starts all of this. But then we come to find out that she actually already opened the gate once, which is never mentioned ever by anyone else, and she oh so conveniently just kind of forgot. Now, before you get riled up, okay, I've learned my lesson from my WandaVision video, so let me just clarify for a second. I am not minimizing her trauma, okay? If anything, the show is, because they are suddenly introducing this idea of her having intense traumatic PTSD or whatever, just for the sake of a cheap plot twist. But anyway, so in season four, we find out that four years before season one, Eleven was friends with this guy, who we come to find out is actually test subject number one, and she thinks that she's helping him escape. But actually, he wants to get revenge on Dr. Brenner and just destroy everyone in the world because when he was a kid, he liked Black Widow Spider. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, it's just, it's just so stupid. <laughs> like, like this was his Joker moment. <laughs> 
Okay, so when number one kills all the kids, Eleven gets mad and goes full on Super Saiyan, opening a gate to the upside down and sending him through it. Which makes no sense in the first place because in the same episode, when Nancy and friends are in the upside down, they find out that the upside down world is stuck in 1983 because that's when Eleven first opened the gate, except it's not and this makes no gosh darn sense. But all the same, so the whole event was so traumatic for Eleven that she just kind of forgot all of it. And it's not just that, she forgets everything between the ages of three to 10. Because like in going Super Saiyan, she also magically remembers about her mom and what happened with all that, which gives her the power to open the gate or whatever. But then she forgets it immediately and has to relearn all this again in season two. Like the entire Nina Project plot thread here is about how she lost her powers in season three and has to get them back. But the way to get them back is for her to dig deep down into her subconscious and dig up these sad, angry memories to strengthen her powers, which she already learned how to do back when she was trying to be like an X-Men or whatever the heck this was supposed to be. So she learns all these lessons just to have to do it all over again a couple years later because uh, actually she has more important memories that never mattered until now. Like Dr. Brenner knows all this. He has tapes. We know he has tapes of everything that happened, but he never telegraphs this ever. It's never mentioned or telegraphed in any way. It's like when Cheryl Blossom learns that her dad actually has a secret twin brother that secretly took his place and no one knew about it until later. But anyway, the point is that like this plot thread here just completely negates everything that Eleven has been through the first three seasons of the show. Until season four, we saw her grow in real time. The lessons she learned and the truth about her past and all that was given to us when it was given to her. We watched her go through her emo phase and rip demons apart with her mind. You know, just teen girl stuff. But then we find out that none of these lessons or character development milestones actually mean anything. And it's not just for her, but this is true for almost everyone on the show. So back in season one, Eleven finds out that Mike is being bullied and she has like no idea what this means. She's like, why would kids bully each other? That's weird. And then proceeds to break the bully kid's arm, make him pee himself, throw him up in the air, that kind of thing. And when Mike sees this, he's like, whoa, this girl's so cool. I don't even care if she gives me cooties. But oh, by the way, guess what? Eleven was actually bullied for most of her childhood as well by other kids. So uh, LOL T he, I guess the whole mouth breather character development plot thread didn't actually mean anything after all. Especially considering that years later in season four, L is being bullied, but doesn't want to tell Mike because then he might think less of her, even though we already did this the other way around in season one. And like I said, when Eleven beats up Mike's bullies, he's totally into it, okay? But then in season four, after Mike watched the entire roller rink bully Eleven and throw a milkshake on her and stuff, and then Eleven goes up to the girl and hits her in the face with a roller skate. <laughs> Suddenly Mike's like, what did you do, L? I can't believe you did that. I don't even know who you are anymore. Are you kidding me? Beating up bullies is what brought you two together in the first place. This is just one example of how some of these characters are just so wildly inconsistent and learn nothing from season to season. Like Mike in season one is exactly the same as he is in season four. He's learned nothing. His entire character is, I like L. And that's his motivation for literally everything he does. In fact, of the main friend group, only Dustin is really worth caring about. I mean, Dustin is so fun to watch, okay? Like he could have his own spinoff show and carry it completely completely on his back. Every scene with Dustin in it is the best scene of the episode. And when Dustin and Steve are together, it's just, it's just pure TV magic. But then you look at Mike, Will, and Lucas, okay? Like, like they have no personality. Even Will, who's been taken hostage by a demigorgon and then possessed by the Mind Flayer, he went through all this stuff, and yet he's just the most boring person. Lucas is also pretty much the same person he was in season one. He's a kid who doesn't like being bullied. I will say though, Nancy and Steve particularly have really grown a lot over the show, and they've become some of the best characters. Steve's glow up from local deuce to who he is now is just some peak genius writing, okay? I gotta get credit where it's due. But this brings up another point. When the show first started, there was this core group of main characters. You had the main four boys, they run into Elle, then you have Nancy, Steve, and Jonathan. The four kids are all nerdy best friends, and then they meet this girl. <coughs> Ew, gross, yuck. And then over here, you have Nancy and Steve who are dating, and Jonathan who ends up helping Nancy find out what happened to her friend Barb, and then of course Nancy starts to fall for Jonathan, so on and so on. And then finally, you have Joyce and Hopper over here. Three main groups of characters, each with very clear-cut dynamics between them and their respective motivations for what they're doing. But then by season four, you have Eleven over here, Will, Mike, Jonathan, Jonathan and Argyle over here, Lucas, Dustin, and Max are over here, Nancy, Steve, Robin, and Eddie over here, Joyce and Murray are over here, Hopper's over there, Jason and the cops are over here, and there's just like way too many characters doing way too many things for me to care. Every season they introduce a few new characters, but in season four they gave us like a bunch of new people that we have no time to learn about or care about in any way. Like in the first episode we meet Chrissy, who's dating Jason, another new character we don't care about, and she starts hanging out with Eddie, another new character we don't know yet. So instead of us learning how these new characters interact with or apply to the establishment, 
established characters that we already like, all of them, at least at first, exist in a vacuum removed from almost everyone else. Like Jason tangentially knows Lucas, and Eddie sorta kinda knows Mike and Dustin, but we don't really get a sense of them like having any real connection whatsoever. Let's contrast this with someone like Max, okay? When we first meet Max, she immediately has something to do with the four main boys because she has the high score in Dig Dug, and the guys want to know like who she is and what kind of girl plays video games anyway. So right away, we, the audience, are interested to find out more about her because she relates directly to the main characters. Or Joyce's new boyfriend, Bob. Now, we saw what Joyce went through in season one with her ex-husband, Will, all that stuff. So the existence of Bob instantly means something substantial. Or even Barb, for example, okay? Barb is Nancy's long-term best friend. She doesn't like that Nancy's dating Steve and starts feeling left out figuratively and literally when Nancy tells her to go home so she can do the old devil's tango with the legendary Minuteman himself. So the circumstances of Barb's death, when the Demogorgon takes her when she's sitting by the pool by herself, it really means something to us and the characters. Chrissy, on the other hand, has like an eating disorder because of her mom, but her death is largely unrelated to that, as opposed to Barb, who dies specifically because Nancy casts her out. And Chrissy's death only really affects Jason, who, again, we don't care about, and Eddie has to go on the run because the cops think he killed her, but Eddie's not emotionally affected by Chrissy's death whatsoever, and we don't really know enough about Eddie at this point to care either way. Throughout the show, they've introduced new characters who are multidimensional and really add a lot to the established friend groups, but then in season four, they give us like 10 new people who are all very one-dimensional archetypes to fill a role just for the sake of the plot. So at the end of season four, part one, we find out that Vecna is actually number one from Eleven's past. And when she opened the gate to the Upside Down the first time and sent him through it, he got hit with some like Ninja Turtle mutagen gamma ray lightning magic or whatever and transformed into Vecna. Even though Will was in the Upside Down for like a week or two, and all he has to show for it is just the worst haircuts I've ever seen. And like, I get that Vecna's supposed to be all menacing or whatever, but I mean, this dude just looks like Jim Carrey from The Grinch. Okay, I, I, I cannot take this man seriously. <laughs> I mean, seriously, what the f- For me, Hopper is easily the best character of the show. He, Dustin, and Steve, they're just like so fun to watch. But I'm kind of split on season four's Hopper because on the one hand, like I said, he's probably my favorite character. But on the other hand, for the sake of the story, him being alive just kind of cheapens the very emotional ending of season three. Elle has to grow up now again because she lost her best father figure. And the letter she reads to us, the audience, has a real tangible emotional impact. So then to just like turn around and be like, ah, just kidding, why you thought he was dead? <laughs> Look at you getting emotionally invested in our show, idiot. To me, it just feels really cheap. I feel like the show might be succumbing to like the Marvelification we see a lot now, where like for the most part, if you have cool CG and emotional music, then like that's really all you need to have a hit show. I know it sounds like I hate Stranger Things, but trust me, if I actually hated the show, then I wouldn't even bother making this video. It's just that I was so invested in these characters and the world, but then to see them just fumble the ball so badly near the end is just like, I don't know, it just kind of makes me sad. Like it's just frustrating to see the characters get older, but the show gets more immature. Like season one and two, they're kind of like 80s adventure movies like The Goonies or E.T. or something. And then season three kind of feels like if Disney Channel made an Austin Powers movie. And season four is just like Riverdale mixed with Cheech and Chong. Like, like, what are they even trying to do now? What is the show supposed to be? I think it's just the classic case of like, they feel like they always have to go bigger every season. And now things have gotten so big and expansive that like, they just don't even know what to do anymore. I mean, of course I'm going to keep watching the show. Okay, I'm invested. But like, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. I don't know, man. Like, like, uh, number one gets sent to the Upside Down, and he gets like superpowers and turns into like the Grinch or whatever. But then, and then Will is stuck in the Upside Down for like two weeks and all he gets is like a dumb haircut. You know what I mean? Like, no, like nothing changes with this kid. Alex thinks Vecna looks like the Grinch. I do. I, I don't see it. But, uh... There's a strong resemblance, my dude. That, 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 that tum? Their tummies look the same. They both got big old tums. <laughs> Why? It's almost like in, in the first season, even the second season, like the friend group was a character and then each member of it was just like a piece of it. Um, and together they were a friend group and then Eleven comes in and they're like, oh, cooties, but she has superpowers, that's cool. But the friend group was the character, not the individual people. And I feel like it's kind of stayed that way. And so then in season four, for example, when Lucas is kind of drawing away from them because he wants to be popular. And then it's kind of like, so the friend group isn't even the friend group anymore. And then it really shows just how boring like Mike and Will are. Half of these characters, like we don't even know. 
It's like, like there's Argyle who's just kind of there as like sort of kind of comic relief. Be- yeah. Because because uh, Will, Mike, and Jonathan are just so friggin' boring on their own that you need you need an extra like Cheech and Chong ripoff kid. 